Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh everyone. Welcome back to another episode of The Firsts. Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salat wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. So tonight's episode connects back to one of the very first people that we covered as we started the series. And that was Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the man who had been in search of monotheism and had been in search of the message of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for so many years, but ultimately passed away on his way back. And we know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam telling us about this man, Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl, being alone on the Day of Judgment as a nation all by himself, having his lofty status in paradise. A man who spent his life not just calling to monotheism, but rejecting idol worship, rejecting the sacrifice of animals in the names of those idols, rejecting the cruel practices that took place in the name of those idols as well, such as burying the daughters alive. A man who before the ayat of Quran were revealed that condemned that brutal practice would go and take the girls as they were about to be buried on the outskirts of Mecca and raise them and marry them off because he knew that it was the right thing to do. And he went and search around the world for what would ultimately take place in his own home in Mecca, but died on his way back, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. And if you remember, he had two children. He had two children. He had one son and he had one daughter. And as he was on his way back to Mecca, he made dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, should he have chosen to forbid Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu, from the suhbah, from the companionship of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Allahumma in kunta haramtani suhbah ta nabiyak. Oh Allah, if you have chosen to forbid me from the companionship of the Prophet in this world, fala tahrim minha ibn Sa'ida, then do not forbid my son Sa'id from having his companionship. That was the du'a. That was the supplication of Zayd on his way back to Mecca. And of course, we know that Allah subhanahu wa taala chose that Zayd radiallahu taala anhu would pass away before the Prophet ﷺ would receive revelation and he could dedicate himself to the Prophet ﷺ as he dedicated himself to monotheism for all of those years, to the way of Ibrahim salam. So his dua was answered in regards to his son, Sa'id. And Sa'id ibn Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl, and we talked about uh, Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl, was a young man who, uh, his physical description is that he was very tall, he was very dark, and he had a lot of hair. And his main quality that we will see play out within Islam and before Islam was his humility. He had so much humility that uh, he didn't really have any enemies. He did not really make, he, he didn't uh, upset anyone in Mecca. We would find that people held him in very high standing because of his humility. So subhanAllah, we find some of these good qualities that existed in the time of Jahiliyyah, in the time of the days of ignorance playing out in beautiful ways in Islam, especially when you look at someone like Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So he was known for his humility. Now I wanna talk not just about Sa'id entering into Islam, but I wanna talk about his wife as well, because his wife is Fatima bint al-Khattab, who is of course the sister of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and the daughter of al-Khattab. And why is that significant? Obviously, you know, that means Sa'id and Fatima were second cousins because Fatima bint al-Khattab ibn Nufayl. And we have Sa'id ibn Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. So it goes back to Nufayl. But what makes this significant uh, beyond just the role that they will play together in the Islam of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu is that think about the father-in-law situation here. What was Al-Khattab known for doing in the life of Zayd, the father of Sa'id? Al-Khattab was the one who would beat uh, Zayd and make it too difficult for him to appear around the Kaaba. He, he literally would, you know, would beat him and humiliate him before Islam even started for calling to Tawheed, for calling to monotheism and made it difficult for Zayd to live around the Haram, to live in Mecca and to be able to still call out based on his fitrah, based on his natural disposition to the way of Ibrahim salam. So subhanAllah, think about this. Sa'id, the son of Zayd, will marry Fatima, the daughter of Al-Khattab. And they will be from the earliest converts to Islam. One of them, 
uh, the father of Sa'id, was the one that was calling to Tawheed in Mecca, calling to monotheism in Mecca, before Islam even started in Mecca. The other one was trying to suppress the call of Tawheed in Mecca before the Prophet Islam even started his call. So uh, we'll talk about, inshallah ta'ala, the dynamic of Sa'id and Fatima together coming into Islam. But you already see an interesting dynamic there that exists with the uh, with, with the, the fathers of uh, Sa'id and Fatima. One father used to beat the other father for the call that would bring both of them to the companionship of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They're both also, of course, from Banu Adi, which was uh, you know, a, a noble tribe uh, of the Quraysh. And um, you know, I want to think of, I want us to think about what made this call so appealing to Sa'id very early on. Okay. Obviously, his father, you know, was the one that was calling to monotheism, was the one that was calling to the way of Ibrahim Islam, that was insisting that what was taking place in Mecca uh, was wrong. So Saeed was one of those, one of the very few who grew up in a house in Mecca that was free from all idols. He grew up watching his father dedicated to speaking the truth, dedicated to justice, dedicated to all of the elements of Tawheed. And you can imagine what type of an effect that would have on Sa'id radiallahu ta'ala anhu seeing his father like that for his entire life, right? So Sa'id grew up around Islam in a way uh, that others did not. And that he grew up around Tawheed, he grew up around monotheism, he grew up around a man that was uniquely dedicated to the religion, to the way of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And so Sa'id radiallahu ta'ala anhu who you know, who sees this, as soon as he hears about this prophet that is calling to Islam, uh, Sa'id radiallahu ta'ala anhu immediately accepts Islam. And, and he is, according to the narrations, also one of the Abu Bakr converts because Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was the first to inform him about Islam. So he's also one of those uh, exposed to Islam officially as a part of the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as the messenger, uh, you know, through Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So Sa'id radiallahu ta'ala anhu is going to be one of the earliest converts of Islam and his environment made him suited to do so and he was the answer to the dua, to the supplication of his father Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Uh, he's also considered, of course, as we know, one of the Ashur Mubashireen, one of the 10 promised paradise. And we'll talk about uh, the narrations about the 10 promised paradise, however, it is important to mention that all of the 10 promised paradise were from the very first batch of those that accepted Islam. Okay, so all of those that the Prophet ﷺ called from the Ashr Mubashirin were from the early converts um, to Islam. Now, unlike the others of the Ashr Mubashirin of the 10 promised paradise, we don't have too much on the life of Sa'id ibn Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu because Sa'id would live his life very quietly dedicated to worshiping Allah and dedicated to being a quiet soldier. Okay, so Sa'id radiallahu ta'ala anhu loved two things. He loved worship and he loved to be an unknown soldier in the battle. He said that even if I have the, the years of Nuh alayhi salam, the life, the, the long span of Nuh alayhi salam, there's nothing more beloved to me than going out and striving in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all these battles and my face being covered with dirt and, and, and fighting and being unknown to the people. Okay, so Sa'id radiallahu ta'ala anhu was a man that was, uh, that, that loved obscurity and this was part of his humility and this is one of the good qualities uh, that we take from uh, the Sahaba. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with them all. So what's the context of the tribe and, and the dynamics of him coming into Islam? And let's talk a little bit more about the family dynamic here. Okay, even though Sa'id was from Banu Adi, the tribe of Adi, which initially would take a harsh stance towards the Prophet ﷺ, Sa'id's family were not hostile to were not hostile to Islam or towards him uh, because of how his family raised him. Okay, so we'll start to see that Sa'id was not someone that was going to have to worry too much, except for the initial days of Islam. Why? Because just as his father had to fear his father-in-law. Sa'id radiallahu ta'ala anhu had to fear his brother-in-law, Umar bin Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Okay, so I know some of you have already asked, when are we going to talk about Umar? When are we going to talk about Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu? Because we're going in order of the first. It's still going to take some time to get to Umar. However, you're going to get a different glimpse into his life uh, through many of these different stories. So here, uh, Sa'id being married to Fatima bint al-Khattab, the sister of Umar. 
she's also known as Umayma uh, and Um Jamil. Uh, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu actually had two siblings who accepted Islam before him. So he had his sister Fatima and his brother Zayd. So Umar had an older brother named Zayd ibn al-Khattab and he had his sister Fatima and both of them actually accepted Islam before Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu and of course Sa'id was married to Fatima and they accepted Islam together and the reason why they all kept it quiet was because they feared the persecution of Umar al-Khattab. Okay? Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu had sworn that he would, uh, that he would kill or that he would, that he would uh, be amongst those that would take care of any member of his tribe if any of them were to accept Islam. Umar thought that the best way to deal with suppressing Islam initially was force. Okay, so we have to make sure that no one from our tribes accept Islam. And what's very interesting is that uh, we don't have uh, much about Fatima bint al-Khattab or Zayd ibn al-Khattab actually, uh, you know, about their birth, about their death. Uh, what we know about Fatima is the famous story of Umar radiallahu anhu accepting Islam in her house. Okay, so we don't have much about Fatima bint al-Khattab, may Allah be pleased with her, except that she was married to Saeed and that she was in the house when Umar would come and would, uh, would, would embrace Islam after that famous episode that would take place there. But that's pretty much all that we have um, on her. Um, also remember that Saeed had a sister. His sister was Atika bint Zayd, and she also accepted Islam. And this is where it starts to get even more interesting. Atika married Umar bin Khattab. Okay, Atika was married to Umar bin Khattab. So Saeed was married to the sister of Umar. Umar was married to the sister of Saeed. Okay, but this would come later on. So uh, not at this point, but later on, Umar would marry Atika bin Zayd. And Atika, after the, the, the uh, martyrdom of Umar, would marry a Zubair ibn al-Awwam. May Allah be pleased with them all. So you have, you know, the story of Islam now for, for all of them. Saeed, Fatima, Atika, all embracing Islam early on, but keeping their Islam secret specifically because of the fear of persecution from Umar bin Khattab. And uh, some of them say that, you know, some of the narrations put them at, as the 14th and 15th to accept Islam. Allah knows best. But where do we find their story in the early days of Islam? Now that you've been introduced to uh, Khabab ibn al-Arat, here is the image or here is the scene that, that, that I want you to think about. Khabab ibn al-Arat used to be the Qur'an teacher early on of Sa'id and Fatima. So Khabab radiallahu ta'ala anhu would go to the house of Sa'id and Fatima, may Allah be pleased with them, and he would teach them the Qur'an. And you remember the beautiful stories and the narrations about Khabab ibn al-Arat radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And so this is where we have the famous story of the conversion of Umar bin Khattab. Imagine the living room of Sa'id and Fatima, and they're sitting and they're learning Qur'an from Khabab ibn al-Arat. And Umar was on his way to kill the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he's told as he's on his way as a means of diverting him that why don't you start with your family first because they've accepted the religion of Islam. And Umar is infuriated because he knows his family members and he feels like he's been, you know, he's been fooled and, you know, this is humiliating. He's telling everyone else to make sure they persecute and suppress the members of their tribe that have accepted Islam. He's on his way to kill the Prophet Sallallahu only to find out that his own sister and brother-in-law Saeed have accepted Islam. And so they're, they're uh, sitting in the living room and the banging on the door comes from Umar. And Umar radiallahu anhu had an unmistakable way of knocking on the door, especially if he was angry. So they knew from the way that Umar radiallahu anhu was banging on the door that he was angry, okay? Khabab hides. Now Khabab cannot uh, afford to get beat up by Umar here. If Umar is going to kill someone, who's going to protect Khabab ibn al-Arat, who is from the weakest of the people of Mecca in these moments, right? Khabab is already being tortured by uh, his master for being a Muslim. And now Umar al Khattab, who is the biggest man in Quraysh, is about to bang down the door and see Khabab teaching Quran and he's going to kill Khabab, right? So Khabab hides. So Umar radiallahu anhu comes in, he sees Saeed, he sees Fatima, he says, Ma the salt, what is that noise that I heard? 
uh, you know, and, and they obviously trying to keep it secret that it was the Quran. He says that uh, I know that you have now followed the way of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his and, and his religion, and you know, as as they, um, you know, as they start to argue, Sa'id radiAllahu anhu says. وَمَاذَا لَوْ كَانَ الْحَقُّ فِي غَيْرِ دِينِكَ What if the truth is in a religion other than yours, O Umar? And Umar pounces on Sa'id. So Sa'id gets the beating of Umar as his father got the beating of Al-Khattab for being upon Tawheed. And we know the famous story that as Umar anhu is brawling and in, is in a fit of rage in the house that he would, uh, that, that, that he would hurt Fatima. And when he saw, as he pushed Fatima, uh, away when he saw the, the the mark that he left on Fatima, when he saw that he had caused her the pain that he caused her, that's when he calmed down. That's when he asked to read the Quran. That's when Fatima tells him that you need to go and you need to uh, purify yourself. That's when he would read Taha ma anzalna alayk al Quran li tashqa surah Taha, and the rest is history, which we will cover thoroughly once we get to the life of Umar bin Khattab radiAllahu taala anhu. But to at least understand the dynamics of this particular incident. That is pretty much the only incident that we have about Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha in detail. And, uh, and, and of course, Saeed, uh, subhanAllah, the, uh, you know, the way that, that history would play out, that he would face the brunt of Umar's anger initially, just as his father would face the brunt of the father the anger of the father of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, except that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, of course, would accept Islam and would join him in the ranks of the 10 that were promised paradise. And subhanAllah, it, you know, it, it also, just to refresh your memory, when Sa'id came to ask the Prophet sallallahu about the father, about Zayd ibn Amr, if he would be in Jannah, if they could seek forgiveness for him because he passed away before Islam, he passed away before actually officially embracing Islam with the Prophet Sallallahu it was Umar and Sa'id coming together to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the narration and asking if they could make istighfar for him, if they could seek forgiveness for Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Na'am istaghfir lahu fa innahu yub'athu ummatan wahda. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, yes, seek forgiveness for him for verily he will be resurrected as a nation uh, all alone. Okay, so that, Gives you some context now of the family coming together. So again, Saeed, Mary, Saeed ibn Zayd, married to Fatima bint al-Khattab, al-Khattab who famously tortured Zayd. Sa Umar ibn al-Khattab married to Atika bint Zayd, all right, the sister of Saeed. So, uh, you know, perhaps inshallah ta'ala we can draw it out and you can see it bin al ta'ala uh, in the notes later on. Uh, but hopefully it gives you an idea of what the family looks like. So here's the good news now. When everyone would migrate or when a large group of people would then migrate to Abyssinia, Saeed, who initially kept his Islam secret because of the fear of the persecution of Umar, now did not have to worry about being a Muslim in Mecca because his brother-in-law was Umar al-Khattab. Okay, so Umar becomes a source of protection as well. No one's going to mess with the family of Umar in Mecca. So it's, you know, one of the reasons why he did not migrate uh, was, you know, because of the brother-in-law being Umar al-Khattab, also because of, as we said, his social standing and his good qualities. And so he does not have to be amongst those uh, that, would, that would flee persecution in Mecca because he was left alone uh, due to his own qualities and due now to being related to Umar al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Now, once they make migration to uh, Medina, once the Hijrah comes, uh, we actually see that Saeed and, and his family and the family of Umar uh, migrate together. They make Hijrah to Medina together. Now, to go through the, the story, the life of, of, of Saeed ibn Zayd, as I said, his life is worship and battle. And he loves to maintain a sense of obscurity. He does not like to be seen or known he likes to be in the background. He serves the Prophet ﷺ in the best way that he could. He actually missed the Battle of Badr along with Talha ibn, uh, Talha anhu, Talha ibn Ubaidillah because they were sent as scouts to, uh, to, to see what the caravan of Abu Sufyan was going to do uh, as Badr was, was to unfold. So they were not able to make it back 
uh, for Badr or back to Medina to go out to Badr in time. So Saeed and, and Talha went out to scout the caravan of Abu Sufyan, got back. The Prophet ﷺ had already made his way out from Medina to Badr and this hurt Saeed and Talha, of course, who both would become very well known for their fighting alongside the Prophet ﷺ, they're defending the Prophet ﷺ uh, for so many years. But subhanAllah, innama al-a'malu bin-niyat, actions are but by intentions. Remember the Prophet ﷺ assigned a share of the spoils of Badr to Uthman. He also did so for both Saeed and Talha. And it wasn't about the spoils. It was about them being included amongst the veterans of Badr because we know the special ranking and place that the veterans of Badr have. So the Prophet ﷺ rewarded them and included them because there was nothing that would keep them away from being in the companionship of the Prophet ﷺ except for the order of the Prophet ﷺ to also be in defense of the Muslims as, uh, as, as Badr was unfolding. So the Prophet ﷺ assigned to them a share of the spoils just as he did to Uthman and included them amongst the veterans of Badr. And just like Talha, <clears throat> Saeed would participate in all of the other major battles uh, with the Prophet Sallallahu He also has, subhanAllah, one of the special distinctions of being one of those who wrote down the revelation. So he's one of the scribes of the Quran, which is which is a very noble honor to, to be, you know, to be amongst those that the Prophet Sallallahu entrusted with the revelation itself. So, you know, these things don't just come out of uh, coincidence or because of some sort of social standing. Sa'id radiallahu ta'ala anhu was the one who was in that house early on learning the Qur'an from Khabbab along with Fatima bint al-Khattab. So these types of, of, uh, of, of distinctions come as a result of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's favor upon a person. As subhanAllah, we see that he was so humble that when he narrates, so you have these narrations about the 10 people promised paradise. And I'm actually going to answer one of the biggest misconceptions from now. I think I did so when we talked about Waraqa or Zaid, but uh, are those 10 promised paradise the only 10 promised paradise? Absolutely not. Okay, so the Prophet Sallallahu promised certain individuals paradise on multiple occasions. Certainly Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha is promised paradise. Not only is she promised paradise, she's amongst those whose house was described by Jibreel alayhi salam in advance of her death in paradise, right? The, the, the special type of home and distinction that she would have in paradise. So we have narrations of men and women outside of the, the famous Ashr Mubashirin, the famous 10 promised paradise that have been promised paradise. But these were a group of people that were known as the 10 promised paradise because the Prophet Sallallahu on more than one occasion mentioned the 10. Okay, so he mentioned these 10. And so subhanAllah, what you find is that out of his humility, when Sa'id narrates the hadith of the 10 promised paradise, he says that the Prophet ﷺ gave 10 people the glad tidings of paradise, but he only names nine of them. And guess who he leaves out? Himself, <laughs> out of his humility. He doesn't even include his own name. And the way we know that he is the 10th is not just because of the obvious omission of himself, but because it's corroborated by the narration of Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu ta'ala anhu um, and, and other narrations that mention the 10 promised paradise. So otherwise, because of his humility, he's almost left out of being named at times. Now, subhanAllah, despite his humility, that does not mean that he does not have a ton of courage. So we find that uh, when, it, when it came to his, uh, his bravery, his courage in battle, Sa'id radiallahu ta'ala anhu was distinguished in Yarmouk, the, 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 the famous battle of Yarmouk. He was distinguished in, uh, in, in the famous battle of Damascus, of Dimashq. He's always in the front lines of battle, but he wanted to be a soldier that was unknown. And so again, just like when we were talking about some of the other companions, as time went on, because of the role that they chose to play of being in the background, other people would not even recognize them. Saeed was one of those people that some people would see in battle and they would think he's just another soldier, but a very brave and courageous soldier. But that's who Saeed is. A Abid, who is a worshiper, uh, you know, and at the same time, a Zahid, an ascetic, and a Mujahid, someone who strives in the path of Allah, who fights uh, extremely, you know, with extreme courage, but shunning the spotlight uh, throughout all of that time. 
Uh, and we find that what that also plays out in is that he, he disliked having any type of political position. He did not want any governorship. He did not want any type of, uh, of rule. And he rejected it over and over again. So multiple khulafa tried to appoint Sa'id to positions and Sa'id radiallahu ta'ala anhu did not want uh, those positions. We find very particularly that uh, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu appointed him to be governor of Damascus. Again, he was instrumental, instrumental in the battle of Damascus. But, you know, he, he's appointed as governor. He's there for a few months. He's, you know, he's now living in the palace of Caesar in Damascus, which is one of the most developed cities in the world. It's got its, all of its glory. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala restore the glory of Asham and, and, and restore the glory of Damascus. Allahumma ameen. You know, so he's seeing all of the glory of uh, Asham. He's seeing all of the glory of Damascus. He's going out to the balconies of these palaces. And he's looking around and he's, you know, he doesn't feel comfortable with the prominence that he has. He doesn't like the royalty. He doesn't like the comfort. He doesn't like the prominence. So he's standing out there and he's, he's staring. He's saying, you know, this is not what I signed up for. This is not who I wanted to be. I didn't want to be in charge of anything. I didn't want to have these palaces at my disposal. And so he sends a letter to Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And he, uh, he asks Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu to allow him to just continue uh, being a soldier, an unknown soldier. But at the same time, he says, look, send someone that is going to be, uh, you know, send someone that's going to be in charge of Damascus, someone who's better fitted for this role. So he says, so I'm coming to you. And he says that by the, you know, what, when, once my letter gets to you, then make sure that you appoint someone else to be in charge of Damascus because I want to continue the rest of my life trying to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, obscure from any type of notoriety. So he is an introvert. He lives an extremely quiet life and he lives a long life. Okay, he outlives, I think he outlives all of the Ashim Mubashirin, if, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Maybe Abd al-Rahman ibn Auf uh, lived as long as him. I, well, I'll have to go back to that. But I think he outlives all of the Ashr Mubashirin, all of the Ten Promised Paradise. But because of his quiet, introverted nature, we barely have any narrations about him. SubhanAllah, he loved to be unknown. And this is similar to Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who narrates the hadith, in Allah yuhibbul abd al-taqi al-ghani al-khafi. Allah loves the servant who is pious, who is self-sufficient, and who is hidden and obscure from, uh, from the public. So there's another connection that we have to Sa'id ibn Abi Waqqas that should be mentioned here, and it should not be taken lightly, which is that just as he loved obscurity, he also was one of those who was known for being mujab al-da'wah, for, for being amongst those whose du'as, whose supplications were answered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you don't want to oppress or wrong a person whose du'as are answered. Now remember the famous incidents that took place with Sa'ad ibn Abi, Abi Waqqas, who the Prophet Sallallahu said, Oh Allah, accept the call, the prayer of Sa'ad when he calls upon you. Similarly, we see with Sa'id ibn Zayd that he was known for having an accepted du'a. And I want to mention uh, this particular narration. It's not a pleasant narration, but it's a real one. And it, it gives us an element that is important because sometimes, sometimes we make demands of ourselves and of others that are not uh, realistic and that the best generation of people to ever live, being the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, would not have accepted in terms of standards. Ihsan, which is to forgive and to overlook and to pardon, these are things that are, ex that, that, are, that are part and parcel of our deen, and they are the norm. But establishing justice, making sure that people have their rights, is also part of our deen. And that's the foundation, that you put people in a position where they're able to forgive and overlook, or they claim their right, fair retribution for anything that has happened to them. And in, you know, in Sahih Muslim, there's a really scary narration about Saeed ibn Zayd. Uh, but subhanAllah, it should be a comfort to those that are mazlumeen, those that are wronged. That Sa'id ibn Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu, years after the Khulafa have passed away, this is under Marwan ibn al-Hakam. So this is long after the Khulafa have passed away. 
And Sa'id ibn Zayd had a neighbor that uh, went to the governor and she claimed that Sa'id had taken part of her land. So this was her, his neighbor and she said that Sa'id had taken part of her, her land. Now, you know, sometimes uh, humble people are taken advantage of. So Sa'id is in a situation now where he's not known to raise his voice. He's not known to fight. He's not known to, uh, you know, he's, he's extremely courageous. Uh, he's a warrior in battle, but in his private life, he's an extremely humble person. SubhanAllah, he has this balance. So the woman took advantage of him in that, in that sense by going to the governor and claiming part of his own property. But it's not just that, SubhanAllah. Sa'id radiallahu ta'ala anhu was probably less offended, it seems to be, from the claim to the property to the claim that he cheated, that he himself was guilty of such an egregious claim. And so when the claim came to him, he said, SubhanAllah, he said, you think that I would steal someone's land when I am the one who heard the Prophet Sallallahu talk about the crime of stealing someone's property. And so Marwan asked, what is that? He said that I heard the Prophet Sallallahu say, من أخذ شبرا من الأرض بغير حقه طويقه في سبع أراضين يوم في سبع أراضين يوم القيامة. That whoever takes a span of land without his right would be made to wear around his neck seven earths, seven earths on the day of judgment. Subhanallah. Think about the 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 penalty on the day of judgment of stealing land, and it's not a small deal. That's stealing property, consuming someone else's property. So Sa'id is saying. I am the one who heard that from the Prophet ﷺ directly. Do you think that I would, you know, then go, turn around after hearing that from the Prophet ﷺ? I'm one of the first Muslims and I dedicated my life to Islam. You think I'm going to throw all of that away by stealing someone's property and stealing someone's land? So Sa'id says, you know what? Fine. He, he, he says, go ahead, take it. But he made dua against that woman. Okay. And this is really powerful. He says, Allahumma in kanat kathiba. فَأَعْمِي بَصَرَهَا وَجْعَلْ قَبْرَهَا فِي دَارِهَا He said, Oh Allah, make her, if she has lied, if she has told a lie, then cause her to lose her eyesight and make her home her grave. SubhanAllah, the same land that she stole from me by claiming that I stole from her, that Oh Allah, you know, if that's the case, take away her sight and allow that land to actually be her grave. Let that be her ending. So Sa'id is not going to fight over this world, but the Prophet ﷺ taught us what? Fear da'wat al-mazloom, fear the cry of the oppressed, because there is no hijab, no veil between the cry of the oppressed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if the person calling upon Allah is a non-believer, even if they're a disbeliever. When they call upon Allah and they complain about oppression, about a wrongdoing that was done to them, there is no veil between that call and Allah, okay? Imagine then if the disbelievers dua made to Allah sincerely because they've been wronged is answered. Think about a Sahabi, a companion who is from the 10 promised paradise, who is so beloved to the Prophet Sallallahu who served the Prophet Sallallahu his entire life, who was honored with writing down from writing down revelation and live that revelation was known for his worship. And that person calls out to Allah and says, Oh Allah, she wronged me. He was so offended, right? SubhanAllah, you know, I am the one who narrated the hadith and she wronged me. And what happened, SubhanAllah, the narrator continues and says that uh, that woman lost her sight. So that part of the dua was answered. And while she was walking in her home, uh, on, in her property, she fell into a well in the same property that she claimed that Sa'id had taken in, which she in fact stole from Sa'id, she fell into a well and died. So Sa'id's dua was answered in regards to her. So it's a, it, it is a different dimension, it's a different layer that we take from the stories of the Sahaba. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us da'wat al-madhlum, given us the ability, the right to call upon uh, him when we are oppressed, when we are wronged. And uh, and this gives us that, you know, that, that knowledge and that uh, that precedent that you know if you are amongst those that are wronged and no one is giving you your right you have the right to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to call upon Allah even if you are called uh, to ihsan called to show forgiveness and things of that sort so Sa'id radiallahu ta'ala anhu has that famous incident he would live a long quiet life as we said he lived uh, throughout all of the khulafa 
he saw the fitna arise and he wanted nothing to do with the fitna. All right, so when he saw the tribulations and he saw the battles start to arise, he moved outside of Medina into the valley and he, uh, and he wanted to spend his life there away from all of these things. SubhanAllah, he, you know, he, he didn't embrace Islam to fight with his own brothers and sisters and to find himself in this. He said, you know what, I have nothing to do with this. So he lived uh, into the 670s. So he, he would pass away in the year 671, uh, uh, which is about 50 years after Hijrah, uh, well into his 70s. And his body was carried back to Medina and he was buried in Al Baqir. SubhanAllah, I said that he outlived uh, most of them, but actually, so Sa'id ibn Abi Waqqas and Abdullah ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with them, were those that brought back his body to Medina. So Sa'id radiallahu anhu outlived him and, um, and they, would, uh, they would be the ones to bury him. Now, SubhanAllah, the way that he died, um, and some of the narrations say 671, some say 673. Uh, he literally prayed Salatul Fajr one morning and he went home and he would lay down and he would die in peace uttering the Shahada. So SubhanAllah, you know, even the way that he passes away is poetic and beautiful. You know, making dua to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for that to be his last action, praying Salatul Fajr quietly, uh, going home, laying down, uttering the Shahada and passing away radiallahu ta'ala anhu and then having his body washed and prayed upon by none other than Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas and Abdullah ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with them. And SubhanAllah, when they went to, uh, to, to get his body, to apply musk to his body, as is the Sunnah, uh, they already found that his body had this wonderful smell. So that's one of the things that's narrated about him after he passed away, is that this smell of his was already uh, a beautiful scent, radiallahu uh, ta'ala anhu, that was coming from his body before they even applied the scent, which is the Sunnah of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I want to mention one more thing, um, which is, uh, you know, which is interesting, subhanAllah, that when Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu was dying, remember Umar ap appointed six people to be the shura, to make up the shura that would choose the khalifa amongst them. What was the common thread between all six of them? They were all from the Ashar Mubashirin. They were all from that group of 10 promised paradise. They were six of the seven remaining the seventh person was Sa'id ibn Zayd. And some of, the, uh, some of the scholars mentioned that he left out Sa'id ibn Zayd for the same reason he left out Abdullah ibn Umar, which was that he did not want to establish a precedent of family being involved in the transfer. He didn't want to involve them uh, in the Khilafah in a way uh, that would uh, take away from the process of the, the Shura. Uh, so this was part of the humility of Sa'id. Some of the scholars say that's part of it as well, that Sa'id just did not want anything to do with it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, you know, spared him in that regard. We only have from him about 30 hadith narrations. Um, eight of them in Sahih al-Bukhari, 11 of them in Sahih Muslim. And the other ones that uh, find themselves in some of the other major works of hadith. And that includes the narration about the Ashr Mubashirin, about the 10 promised paradise, uh, which he, for, amongst which he is included. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be pleased with him. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be pleased with his family. And subhanAllah, you know, I was just thinking, you know, there was a time where his father went out to Damascus looking for Islam. And then his son, who he made dua, would be the companion of the Prophet Wasallam, would be amongst those that would fight in the, in the great battle of Damascus that would, uh, you know, that, that would call people to Islam in a way that his father was not able to even utter just a few words about monotheism in Mecca. And everything that we see that happened with Sa'id, his entire contribution is the da'wah of his father. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he taught us, of course, about the special du'a of the father and the special du'a of the mother, the du'a of the parents. So his entire life is also part of the good deeds of his father, Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. May Allah be pleased with them all. May Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala allow us to be gathered uh, with the family and the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu around the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Jannatul Firdaus. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullahu khayran. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.